எத்தனை பேர் வந்திருக்கிறாங்க
Ladies and gentlemen, students, good evening, and we welcome you to the third session of uh, AOGEN Academics. So we have a very interesting talk this evening, and we hope all of you will enjoy it. Uh, this will be on how to read a paper. We have two distinguished uh, chairpersons, and I would like to welcome uh, Professor Sandeep Mathu from Ames, Delhi, uh, Professor Anupama Rajan Babu from the Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Kochi. Over to the chair uh, Good evening, everybody. Uh, uh, it is uh, last two sessions of IOJ. We also are interested in this. Uh, he is a radiation oncologist. He's working at uh, Tata Medical Center, Kolkata. And uh, he is a uh, in academic interest and is a keen researcher as well. So uh, we can expect an inter interesting session. And after the session, he'll be having a quiz also. We would like all of you to participate in the quiz. We can take the question and answer after the quiz session, as uh, after the quiz is over. Anthem for the talk. Thank you, Dr. Anupama and Dr. Sandeep. Thank you, Ayubin coordinators and the organizers for allowing me to speak in the presentation. I hope I am clearly audible. Yes, you are audible. You're very clear. So today we have a task of understanding how to read a paper and incorporate in our clinical practice. Let me just share the screen. Right. So can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes. Thank you. So, why do we need to do this? First, let's understand. The reason is almost all of us want to practice evidence-based medicine. And we know the practice of evidence-based medicine relies on two critical ingredients. You need to have an individual clinical expertise and you need to have good quality external clinical evidence, which typically you will obtain from a systematic research. Now, the first ingredient is possibly not very hard to get. You get it from experience, you get it from diligence. The second component on the other hand is not so easy, although we see an ever increasing volume of medical literature coming up every day. Now let's do a simple thought experiment to understand why this is so. For any condition in the human body or any research question, there can be any number of competing research hypotheses. In this diagram, each circle represents a competing research hypothesis. There are total thousand of such circles and out of these around 10% that is 100 are actually true. The rest of them are incorrect hypotheses. Now this is an over generous estimate. We know in scientific research most of the hypotheses that we have are actually untrue. But let us suppose you have the situation where you actually end up conducting randomized controlled trials in each of these hypotheses. What would be the result? The result would be that out of these 100 around 80 would be positive. This would be so-called true positive. These are positive results of truly positive hypothesis. Because you have chosen a 5% type 1 error, around 41 will be false negative. These are actually negative hypothesis, but your study research has shown that this is positive. And these remaining are all true negatives. These are all negative studies. Now what happens is that unfortunately, because of the way medical publishing works, the vast majority of these will never get published. And as a result of this, you come up with a situation where out of these number of studies, only 55% will be truly positive. Now, this is a frightening statistic. This is if you have very well conducted studies without bias, this is what happens. So you can imagine what happens when you try to look at literature where the vast majority of evidence is low quality observational studies. Now, of course, in medicine, the problem that is there is that we cannot conduct randomized controlled trials for every condition, every time to answer our clinical queries. There is a challenge with replication in medical science because of the costs and time scales involved. And therefore, it is imperative that each one of us who is trying to apply evidence-based medicine in clinical practice understands how to critically appraise a paper. The word critical appraisal is important. And what we know is that this is not something, this is new. 
This is something that has been the foundation of evidence-based medicine for years now. And there are many tools to allow you to do that. For example, this 2004 systemic meta-analysis showed 121 published tools. Overall, what we know is that there are four basic pillars on which the critical appraisal rests. It is irrespective of what kind of scientific literature you are evaluating. The first is whether there is a clearly focused question. The second is whether the methods used are valid. Third is, are the valid results important? And finally, are these valid and important results applicable to your patient population? Now, the key elements of the research question are population, intervention, comparison, and outcome. All of these should be present in the research question for you to make an understanding of the research protocol that has been followed. And if the paper does not have a clearly defined research question, which has all of these four elements, you can understand that most of the time, the research paper is not worth your time. There are a few key other things that you can see. For example, in therapeutic research, you can see whether the intervention was randomized, and if all the patients who entered the trial were accounted for and analyzed, in diagnostic studies, you should basically see if there is an independent blind comparison that was done with the reference standard. Studies which relate to harm, usually observational studies, should have clearly defined comparator groups where exposures and outcomes were measured in the same way. And studies which deal with prognosis should have a long and complete follow-up with a representative patient sample. Now, the most common types of study that we would be evaluating for our use in evidence-based practice is a randomized controlled trial. There are many other types of studies and there are specific guides available for specific types of studies. But I will take a broad overview today due to the paucity of time. People who are interested can have dedicated courses which are organized by CEBA, the Center of Evidence-Based Medicine, which is a three-day course which deals exclusively with this. So there are two key things that you should see in the randomized controlled trial. First of all, regarding the validity. And the first question that you must be able to answer after reading the paper is whether the assignment was truly random or not. Now the true randomness does not mean just the word randomized. It depends upon two broad things. First of all, how was the sequence of randomization generated? If it was generated by any other method which was not truly random, for example, when the date the patient presented in the OPD or by flipping the books of the pages, pages of the book, you can rest assured that there is a lot of bias. The second key point in a random sequence generation is that there should be allocation concealment, which means you or the investigating team member should not be able to guess or know where the second patient, where the next patient will be falling, in which group the next patient will be falling. Any of these two principles are vitiated, you can understand that the randomization process itself is flawed and any results that are coming out from that study is possibly incorrect. The next important thing to see is the accounting of the patients. Now, most of the randomized controlled trials today will be publishing a consort flowchart, which basically tells you how the patients were screened, how many were randomized, how they were treated, how many dropped out, and how many had the event of interest. This is very important and in addition to that, you must make sure that you have a clear cut idea about the follow-up of the patient. If the follow-up was inadequate for the endpoint concern, so for example, in case of breast cancer, if you see a trial which is having overall survival results presented at two years, you can understand the results are not adequate. The next important thing to understand is whether there was an intention to treat analysis. Now, the reason why this is important is because any randomization process removes the variability in the patient characteristics or balances the variability in the patient characteristics before randomization. It has no influence whatsoever on the patient characteristics after randomization process. So if you are doing a so-called per protocol analysis, you run into a significant risk of bias. There is possibly an only a single exception where a per protocol bias analysis should be reported and looked into. These are non-inferiority studies. The next question with regards to validity is whether the patients, clinicians, and the study personnel were blinded to the treatment allocation, whether the groups were similar at the start of the treatment, which means they were worked up in exactly the same manner before the randomization process had occurred. And finally, aside from the experimental therapy, 
what other co-interventions were administered. Now there are several problems which can occur from co-interventions. Take for example a situation where a randomized control trial is being done for comparing a highly immunogenic chemotherapy regimen against immunotherapy. Now the patients in the immunotherapy arm will usually not be prescribed antiemetic prophylaxis which is similar to the patients who are in the highly uh, emetogenic chemotherapy arm. And this brings about a problem that you cannot validly conclude that the results you are seeing in the trial are not because of the antiemetic prophylaxis. The way to solve this dilemma is of course to go back and look into studies where this highly emetogenic chemotherapy regimen has been applied alongside another regimen in this kind of cancer and see whether there is a treatment effect or not. Or you look back at the immunotherapy regimen and see whether the same immunotherapy regimen has been used along with the highly emetogenic chemotherapy and see whether the associations of the study still remain valid in the same population. So the co-interventions are something that you must pay a big amount of attention to. Coming to the results, we are basically looking at two points. What is the treatment effect, how large it is, and how precise is the estimate of the treatment effect. Now, in most randomized controlled trials, what we are looking for is, is the risk of the event. The risk is basically the probability of the event happening. In case of randomized controlled trials with survival as the endpoint, this would be things like survival probability, probability of death, progression-free survival, disease-free survival, and so on. Now, the change in the risk that is usually seen in randomized control trial is usually presented as a risk ratio. This will be an odds ratio when you have binary outcomes, say for example, a cohort study or a randomized control trial, where the outcome may be things like pathological complete response. Hazard ratios are typically used when you have time to event endpoints. Relative risks are used for binary endpoints when there is studies from the case control study. And the risk reduction can be basically described in terms of an absolute risk reduction, which is basically a subtraction of the risk, and a relative risk reduction, which is 1 minus the relative risk. The relationship between the relative risk and the absolute risk reduction is very vital to understand. For us clinicians, it is the absolute risk reduction that really matters. And this plot on the right side shows why this is so. Suppose in the control arm, your event rate is around 80%. You come up with a 5% absolute risk reduction in your trial. That translates into a basically 6% relative risk reduction. On the other hand, if your control rate is around 15%, for the same absolute risk reduction, you are looking at a 33% relative risk reduction. Now, relative risk reductions are excellent and sound are good for news bites but they are not good for us. So scientific results which are published in terms of relative risk reduction need to be looked into carefully so that you don't miss a very small absolute risk reduction. Now to quantify this benefit in terms of something that you can use for your patients, the recommendation is to use something like a number needed to treat or a number needed to harm if you are looking for adverse effects. It is basically the reciprocal of the adverse of the absolute risk reduction and it can be calculated from things like odds ratio, it can be calculated from hazard ratio. There are many online calculators available which can help you to calculate the number needed to treat. Now I have plotted what happens to the number needed to read, treat for different levels of relative risk reduction based upon different baseline risk of event in the control arm. See this. In case your baseline risk of the event is very high, say 80%, even a small relative risk reduction of 10% results in a very low number needed to treat, which means you will be mostly using this intervention in your patient population. On the other hand, look what happens over here. At a baseline risk of around 10%, same relative risk reduction, the number needed to treat increases to 200 Please note that this is a logarithmic scale given so that you can actually see these numbers. So therefore, from your perspective, when you are trying to use this evidence, it is important to understand the absolute reduction in the risk and try to convert it into a number needed to treat so that you get an idea of how
how useful this intervention really can be. In addition to this, you also need to understand the precision by which this estimate was obtained. And typically what we need to have is the confidence intervals. Usually the 95% confidence intervals will be presented. Now one very key point to understand and one question that came to me a few days ago, is it always true that if the 95% confidence intervals are on one side of the bound, it means the results will be statistically significant? The answer is no. There can be situations, in specifically when you are dealing with quantitative data, where you may have statistical significance, although the confidence intervals will overlap. So once you are seeing the confidence intervals, one of the most important things to understand is what is the effect size and what is the bounds. Now this is an example of a result which is statistically significant, but not clinically relevant. When you are having this kind of result, typically this would be seen in large sample size studies done from pharma. You can rest assured that you cannot use this study result, although this would probably get FDA approval. This is a typical kind of 95% confidence intervals that would be obtained usually from investigator initiated studies where you will have a very large risk difference, but the wide confidence intervals. Now this would be considered as a negative study usually because the study, study does not meet its primary endpoint. However, it does not mean that this effect is not clinically relevant. In negative trials, always take a look at the upper bound and see if it is clinically relevant to you. If that is true, that means this trial has failed to exclude a potentially important treatment effect and therefore it is important that you validate these findings or confirm these findings in another clinical trial. What about p-values? There is an extensive literature on the misuse of p-values. There is things called p-hacking. What you have to understand is that p-values should not be the basis on which you make the decisions. Today's quiz will be on p-values. So p-values is basically telling us whether the data conforms to an assumed statistical model. That's what the p-value tells us, nothing more. It does not tell us if it is small that the null hypothesis is false. It does not tell us if it is more that the null hypothesis is true. It does not tell us anything about the effect size and it does not tell us if this effect is important. So the p-value is the last thing you should look at when you are evaluating a model or a scientific result. You should start off with the effect estimate, look at the overlap of the 95% confidence interval and then take a look at p-value. Now, the next important thing that I want to highlight is subgroup analysis. Clinicians who often use randomized clinical trials, results in their patient population know that groups of patients can respond differently to the intervention. And they tend to look at subgroup analysis to see whether they can make informed choices regarding therapy decisions in groups. Unfortunately, subgroup analysis are not meant for this. Subgroup analysis are meant for testing the effect of the treatment as an interaction test in different subgroups. That's all. This is what a typical subgroup plot would look like. You would have a square box, which tells you in this case, the hazard ratio and these bounds of the 95% confidence interval. This is the baseline estimate. And this is actually a slightly incorrect way of presenting the plot, because if you have this solid bar line, where the effect estimate is, you can truly understand how the subgroup analysis results are. This is data from the CREATEX trial. People who know this trial will know this is a randomized controlled trial where they tested when you gave capsicabin to patients with ER2 negative breast cancer who had not had a pathological complete response after you had given chemotherapy, did it improve the outcomes? The CREATEX trial was a positive trial. You can see over here, that the overall survival was meeting its primary endpoint, that its addition of capsicabin did indeed result in an improved overall survival. It also improved the disease-free survival. Interestingly, the subgroup effect plot showed that patients with triple negative breast cancer seem to be having the benefit, while the patients with ERPR positive with cancers did not. This is based upon the way the 95% confidence intervals were. Now, this is what happens if you misinterpret the subgroup analysis. 
see, the interaction test is actually not significant, which means statistically speaking, there is no interaction between the treatment effect and the subgroup. In addition to this, the same subgroup plot shows various other groups like this patients with low BMI, patients who have a low pathological complete response rate or more residual tumor burden, and patients who have received taxins in chemotherapy have nearly the same kind of hazard ratio and all of their 95% confidence intervals are on the other side of the baseline. So this is the reason why to use a subgroup effect in your clinical patient population, you need to have very stringent criteria. And the recommendation is to look at this in three broad steps. First is take a look at the study design, whether this subgroup was measured before or after randomization. Next, take a look whether the subgroup effect was pre-specified or was it data-driven, which means the subgroup effect was analyzed after the study was data was analyzed. And if was it a small number of hypothesized effects tested, please remember more number of hypotheses that you test because of multiple testing, you will get positive results in nearly 5%. Analysis of the subgroup effect rests on the interaction test, which basically tells that whether there is a high or low likelihood of chance explaining the subgroup effect. That's all. And finally, whether the subgroup effect is independent. Lastly, take a look at the subgroup effect context. Is the size of the subgroup effect large? Is this interaction consistent across studies? Is this interaction consistent across close related outcomes? Say, for example, whether the same subgroup effect is present in disease-free survival as well as overall survival. And finally, is there a biological rationale for the subgroup effect? This has been very aptly highlighted in the analysis of the results of the ICS-2 trial, where the authors actually did a subgroup analysis based upon the zodiac sign and showed that if you have a specific zodiac sign, you tend to derive a significant benefit from intervention. That is, if you misinterpret the way subgroup analysis are supposed to be interpreted. After seeing the validity of the results, the next thing that you need to understand is the generalizability. And that depends on many factors. The trial setting, the patient selection criteria, the patient characteristics, the trial protocol, the outcomes and follow-up, and finally the adverse effects. You need to have a thorough look at all of these points. And believe me, it is not easy. You should not, by any means, look just on basis of the inclusion exclusion criteria as to whether the trial can be generalized in your patient population. The healthcare system in which this study was done is very important. You need to look at whether you're looking at a randomized or a non-randomized intervention. You need to look at what number of patients declined randomization and now there are there is a move to show what is the kind of characteristics the patient who declined randomization had. Of course, there are ethical issues with collecting data in this population, but still, this is something important. Run-in periods are often seen in drug trials, and they are also a source of bias, because run-in periods result in exclusion of patients who have serious adverse effects from the drug. This might be ethically correct, but as a result of this, the generalizability of the trial in your population becomes difficult because you cannot do a run-in period for your populations. Regarding patient characteristics, the stage and severity of the disease which was there is important. Your absolute risk of the poor outcome in your population needs to be known to you. If a trial has been done in early screen-detected breast cancers in the West, do they have the same risk as your population? This is a question that you must answer. Co-intervention, I have already told you, Coming to outcomes, surrogate outcomes are very important. These are being clinically, these are being used extremely commonly in clinical trials now. These are basically outcomes which correlate with the main outcome. For example, pathological complete response of neuroadjuvant chemotherapy correlates with the overall survival. The problem is that surrogate endpoints are not very meaningful for the patient. They don't allow you to calculate the number of need needed to treat, for example, survival. And as a result, Surrogate endpoints are useful to get FDA approvals, accelerated FDA approvals, but they don't tell you anything about the clinical benefit. Adverse effect reporting is another important thing that you must look at. Completeness of reporting, rate of treatment discontinuation, all of these tell you how severe the side effects can be. 
And most importantly in the protocol, you have to take a look at the safety procedures that you follow. If you cannot follow them in your clinical setting, it becomes unethical to apply this practice in your clinical setting. Overall, the most important question to answer is, is there a strong reason to suspect the results of this trial will not be applicable to your patient population? You should not ask the question, will it be applicable? You should ask, will not be applicable? And therefore, if you answer this question honestly, you will often be able to tell whether the study results can be implemented. Now, implementation science is a branch of research in itself. And the reason is, it is not easy to implement evidence in clinical practice. This is a survey that we did in 75 cancer centers across India a few years ago when I was in Malabar Cancer Center, where we tried to see if the ASCO NA standards were fully implemented, partially implemented, or incompletely implemented in patient populations. We found only a single center which had actually fully implemented the ASCO NA standards. What is worrisome is that chemotherapy order and prescription standards were fully implemented by only 25% of the centers surveyed. And these are major can cancer centers. What does this mean? These standards were derived from Western literature based on Western data and Western evidence. It is understandable there would be resource limitations in application of these standards, but basic things where things like proper anti-emetic prophylaxis is also not done in many of these centers. There are many barriers in implementing evidence and these can be categorized into three broad categories. You can have system level barriers, staff level barriers, and intervention level barriers. System level barriers are macro barriers. These are things like staff time, workload, workflow, culture to the change, whether there are people who are willing to change or Staff level barriers are micro level barriers. They are at the person level. So you have to understand the perceived needs, the ownerships, the understanding and awareness regarding the change. What is the role identity that this person is playing in the organization and so on. And finally, coming to the intervention, it is very important to understand what is the ease of integration? What is the evidence that this could improve outcomes? What is the safety data? And finally, what is the support available? and what is the support you will need to do. This is a very good resource. If you are interested in implementation science, there's an extensive body of work that has been done. You can take a look at this. So we did another study where we tried to implement distress screening for our patient population. Distress, as you know, has been proposed as one of the vital signs of the patient. And one of the recommendations that comes out from Western literature is can you apply distress, you should do distress screening for all the patients presenting in your population. Now what happened when we did this study was that we said that okay, we were working in a small organization, we had very good relationships with each other, nine of us came together and we had a good support system in terms of staff like nursing assistants and nurses and we thought why don't we try and see if we can administer this distress thermometer to all the patients who come in the OPD. The nursing assistants were there to translate each of these things, each of these sentences. The distress thermometer is very simple to fill and easy to understand. Believe me, there were 15% of the population we could not do distress screening in, in that single day. And this is despite nine oncologists in different disciplines trying very hard to do this. So implementation is very difficult. Whenever you are trying to implement an evidence, you have to have a very good understanding of the resource limitations you are having. So the approach to implementation of evidence-based medicine starts from understanding what is your system, how should you manage your staff, and how should you adapt that intervention. Oftentimes, you cannot apply that intervention directly. You have to understand how you will adapt it. If you go to the Joanna Briggs Institute, they have a seven-step process which they recommend to be followed whenever you're trying to implement evidence. First is to start with identification of the practice area, which basically involves preparation of a plan or a protocol. Engaging the change agents, people who will bring about the change is very important. Building up team-based communication strategies is important. Next, assessment of the context and readiness to change. Review of practice against evidence-based literature by a clinical audit. 
and finally implement the change after taking into consideration all the above steps. You must have a follow up audit plan also ready to understand how well you implemented this. And finally, you should have plans available for sustainability and scaling up. So this is something that we did when we implemented Deep Inspiration Breathhold in Tata Medical Center. This was in 2015. So the first step started when we understood that patients with left-sided breast cancer often have high cardiac doses. DIBH can reduce these doses and therefore we decided to start doing it. We had the machine available in our center. The lead physicist started a training process whereby all radiographers were trained in DIBH on successive Saturdays. The theory as well as the practical implementation was taught. A proper quality assurance of the DIBH process was done. Because of the field size limitations, we had to use a very innovative technique to match the supraclavicular field to the best tangent fields. These are all things that went on during the training and the pilot testing phase. The 50 consecutive patients were taken up under supervision and we noted down the time taken for each of these as a service development audit. Finally, when we implemented this, we showed based on the results of the pilot testing, we could implement it and across over the period of time where we treated more number of patients, the time to do deep inspiration record on the time commitments for the staff became lesser and lesser. Finally, we published the results and now, as far as sustainability is concerned, we are re implementing deep inspiration record in all patients of left-sided breast cancer since then. One last bit of uh, technical thing I would like to tell you, before you start implementing evidence in the system, understand your own cognitive bias. This is very important. Cognitive bias arises from our mental shortcuts that we take. And these can have an influence on the way evidence-based medicine is applied. Two key points, omission bias and commission bias, are there. Omission bias basically is the tendency to judge actions which lead to harm as worse than equally harmful non-action. And commission bias is the tendency to prefer action over inaction to avoid the regret over missed opportunity. Now these two biases are commonly there in all of us. Omission bias probably more because we tend to avoid harm as compared to commission bias. But both of these biases can affect the way we implement evidence-based practice. The way to avoid the cognitive bias is you have to go through a process known as cognitive debiasing. Although it sounds complex, basically what it implies is that take time to think of how you are thinking. The way you can do that is the basis by based upon use of decision aids, use checklists, planning needs, and think about what you are doing. Of course, having a well-designed clinical protocol to minimize variance and scope of documentation with deviations is very important. To conclude, reading a scientific paper is a skill that needs to be acquired. You need to have sound grounding in the principles of EDM. You need to understand that study design matters. Not every study design can answer every question. There is an important reason why you need to pay attention to the confidence intervals and not to the p-values. Do not place faith on your subgroup analysis. Remember that we will all have cognitive biases. This is natural, this is human, and this should be embraced rather than stigmatized. Develop protocols and checklists, and overall, have a skeptical outlook, though not a minimalistic one. Finally, read, read, and read some more. These are the tools and resources that are available. I will share the link of the presentation to all of you, so you can take a look at these. This one is very interesting. It's a catalog of bias by the CEBM group, where they're trying to catalog all the medical biases which can happen in research. This is the Joanna Bragg Briggs website, which gives you several critical appraisal tools. These are also there in the critical appraisal skills program and the CEBM critical appraisal tools. All of these are checklists that you can use, and they make the appraisal of literature very fast, simple, and reproducible. So thank you. If I have the organizer's permission, can I now go ahead with the quiz? Yes, I think uh, it was already announced, so you can go ahead. Okay, so we can go ahead with the question answers then. Uh, we'll have the question answers after your quiz. After the quiz. Okay, okay, fine. Okay, so if you have already downloaded the app or if you can join in through your web browser, please go to kahoot.it 
and just enter the game pin 829155. I will wait for around five minutes. So this Kahoot app can be accessed through your mobile phone as well as on your laptops or desktop. Yes, you yes, you can do it in laptop, you can do it in mobile. Phone. Once you go there, you need to have a separate browser window open. Yeah. That's all. So just I'm informing the viewers that you'll have to enter the game pin. Shall we take a question when they're waiting for people? Yeah, yeah. Why not? Why not? Okay, sure. So, Dr. Chakrabarti, there was one question from Dr. Hemant. He says that what is the meaning of interaction in subgroup analysis? Can you please elaborate further? Yes, of course. So, um, the way to simply explain it is that when you are doing, say for example, suppose you are evaluating May a access to your microphone, camera, and storage. Uh, can you uh, hear me? Yes, I don't know. Uh, no. I think somebody's mic uh, be muted. Yeah, yeah. We've done it. Please scan. Please scan. Please scan. Okay, so uh, do you want me to repeat the question? Uh, yeah, what is the meaning of interaction in subgroup analysis? Can you elaborate? Yes, yes. So when we are doing a standard analysis, say for example, survival using things like the Cox regression, what do we do? We put in the treatment as one of the terms, and then we put in, say, the prognostic factor like age. Now the telemetry. Uh, the host can please mute the others. Please uh, mute everyone. Shall I mute everyone? Yes, please. Can you do that? Yes, I can. Okay. I will just unmute uh, you. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Sandeep, can you, can you hear me now? Yeah, yes. Great. So what I was telling is that normally when we do a regression analysis or a model based analysis, we have the treatment as one of the parameters in the model. And then we have a parameter like gender. Interaction testing is when we have the interaction between the treatment and the parameter typically as a multiplication term. So this would be in a Cox proportional hazards model. This would be specified as like this. You will have the treatment say X, T1, T1 is basically the treatment, plus Y, G, and then, uh, just a minute, um, I think it has started, uh, just one minute, uh, pause, uh, just a minute, um, oh, it started on its own, hmm. I think it has started. <laughs> okay, since we have started, maybe we will just finish it. Yeah. Okay, so the question was uh, to choose your discipline. This is a poll question. So we have 70% radiation oncologists. Do you have experience with clinical research? Good, we have a good number of answers coming in. I think what happened was when people stopped joining the app automatically launched. Yeah. Okay. So 36, 37, great. Oh, so nearly more than double the number have experience with clinical research in this audience. That's excellent. And the years of experience after postgraduate training that you have. Okay, so vast majority actually have 15 years or more experience, so that's good. 
And finally, have you been a principal investigator of a clinical trial? These are the five questions I think I had. Oh, more, nine people actually have been principal investigators of clinical trials. So that is interesting. We have a very learned audience today. And I imagine the answer to this question will be yes, because all of us are in this course. Hmm. Still nine people feel they haven't been, so that is interesting, okay. Okay, now this is a true or false question. The question is, when the p-value is 0 0.01, the null hypothesis has only got a 1% chance of being true. Please mark it as true or false. Okay, so six people got it right. Let's see who got them right. Raghav Hemant. Hemant has climbed up. Okay, this is the first question, so don't worry. And the explanation is this, that the p-value assumes that the test hypothesis is true. It is not a measure of the chance that the hypothesis is true. Okay, get ready for the next question, please. Okay, true and false. Statistical significance is not a measure of clinical significance. This is easy if you have paid attention to the presentation that we did. I expect 100% on this one. Oh, six people still did not think so. Hmm. Sid climbs up. You know, the faster you respond, the more points you get. The reason, of course, is very simple to understand. Statistical significance, when measured using p-value, has no relationship whatsoever with the clinical significance. The reason is p-value can be simply determined by the large clinical study. So if you have a larger sample size, your p-value can be significant. It has nothing to do with your effect size. Okay, true or false? P-value less than 0 0.05 indicates the effect size is large. Now, one thing to important to understand is that the effect size, that is the risk ratio, hazard ratios, do not depend upon the p-value. The magnitude of the effect size has nothing to do with the p-value. The p-value is basically a check of your model assumptions for the data. Nothing more, nothing more. So it is very important if you are looking at the effect size, you basically look whether you want to see if it is clinically important or not. You basically take a look at the confidence intervals. The effect size is the estimate the hazard ratio, relative risk, and so on. Now, P equal to 0 0.005 is not the same as P equal to 0 point, less than equal to 0 0.005. This is a tricky question. Okay, so most of the people have got it correct. That's very good. Now, why this is so? The reason is, that P less than equal to 0 0.05 does not give you adequate information for you to evaluate the model. You should present the absolute P values rather than denoting it by a sign. Oftentimes, when you have a P value of 0 0.05, this basically indicates that you have a borderline statistical significance. Less than 0 0.05 can mean anything. It can be 0 0.00001 also. So therefore, the absolute value of P value with an equal to sign should be presented in your literature. P equal to 0 0.012 is the correct way to report P value. Okay, simple one. I expect 100% on this one. Yes, most of the people have got it correct. 
right atul has got a high ancestry of 5 congratulations atul again when p values are reported as less than sign a certain value the statistical test results cannot be accurately interpreted this is only advisable when you have very very small p values okay you should try to use equal p values hmm? one should always use two sided p values Hmm, that's good. Very good. Most of you caught that trick question. Now, why is this so that you do not need to use two-sided p-values always? The reason is the type of p-value that you want to use depends on the type of testing that you want to perform. So, a p-value needs to be two-sided only if you are interested in finding out if the effect size is a value above or below the target. if it is something like you are interested in finding out whether the test drug is as good as the control where you are not interested in the superiority at all you are basically looking at a one sided p value this is the typical hypothetical testing that will be done for non inferiority studies for example there is a 5% chance of error when you reject the hypothesis when p value is less than 0.005 okay now this is interesting who has won atul is still leading hmm very good three people have done answered three correctly So if the hypothesis that you are rejecting is true, then your chance of error is actually hundred percent. This is very important. The five percent basically refers to how often you would be rejecting the hypothesis incorrectly if this test was repeated again and again. This is the very important statement. Even I was under this misconception before I went through this presentation and read up the American Statistical Association of their guidance of p value. you should take a very close look at that manuscript there is a very interesting section in that the next question hazard ratio 0.9 p value of 0.1 implies there is no hazard of outcome people who are getting no need to answer basically means the time is up right the answer is false and the reason is so let's see who has won atul is still leading excellent atul Srinivas is close by. A p-value of more than 0.05 simply indicates that the null hypothesis is one of the hypotheses which has a probability of more than 0.05. No effect, that is zero effect, zero hazard, can only be assumed when the point estimate of the hazard is also zero. So that's why you cannot assume that the effect is zero if the p-value is more than 0.05. Similarly, you cannot say. the effect is going to be very huge if the p value is less than 0.0 so p value has nothing to do with effect size right next question true or false p value is equal to 0.1 means the null hypothesis is true the answer is false why because the value of the p does not determine the truth of the hypothesis the truth of the hypothesis is an intrinsic property of the hypothesis it has nothing to do with the p value it just tells you whether you should reject this hypothesis or not it doesn't tell you whether the hypothesis is true or false p less than 0.05 means the null hypothesis is false this is just the reciprocal of the previous question so right um some people still got it wrong but i imagine it can be time pressures srinivas has moved up and he is now the first place followed by riddhi jyoti who has got a streak excellent 
there is no relationship between the truth or the correctness of the hypothesis and the p value p value is simply the probability that the data you are observing is unusual for the model purpose that's all nothing more Okay, multiple randomized control trial for the same hypothesis show the p-value is more than 0.05. This implies the hypothesis is wrong. Right, most of the people have got it right this time. And Srinivas is leading by nearly 300 points. Excellent. So the p-value depends upon the sample size, okay? Depending on the sample size tested in a randomized control trial, you can have multiple randomized control trials which were underpowered and therefore the p-value was not significant. If you do a meta-analysis of these randomized control trials, you may get a statistically significant effect size. What you should be interpreting is whether the effect size is sufficiently large or not. So just two more questions left. The same hypothesis was tested in two populations. One had a P of 0.006 and the other is P004. Results are not conflicting. Right. Most of you got it correct. The direct, the results, whether they are conflicting or not, does not depend on the magnitude of the p-value. The p-value again just tells you the probability of the model test. That's all. Nothing more. So if the test is performed for the same hypothesis is influenced by the population characteristics and again the sample size, the key thing is not the p-value but the effect size, magnitude and duration. So this has been very classically demonstrated in the recent randomized control trials which have evaluated abbreviated trastuzumab schedules. We have had one randomized control trial which proved non-inferiority and two did not. But when you do a meta-analysis you would find that the results would probably be in the direction of non inferior So a test shows a p-value of 0.03. There is a good chance that the next test will have a smaller p-value. Right, the answer is false and most of you got it correct. The reason is if the p-value of 0.03 is observed, it means that the chance that the next study will show a p-value of less than 0.03 is also 3%. Size of the p-value will be determined by the sample size and the effect size. So this is why you cannot get it correct. Okay, I think we are at the last question. No, we are not. We have finished. Riddhi Jyoti has won, followed by An Srinivas and Anand. Congratulations, you won't be getting any prizes. Okay, now let's go back to our question that was asked. And I will just close this. Right. So the question was about interaction testing. So interaction testing, as I was mentioning, is basically putting in an additive or a multiplicative term in your model where the treatment is given as a multiplicative term with the uh, group that you are interested in. The p-value is the p-value of the interaction term, not the p-value of the subgroup. There is a very important critical thing. Normally, when you are doing this, uh, when you are uh, basically analyzing the results uh, of Cox proportional hazard, you will basically have the hazard ratios and the p-values coming out for different groups, right? You will need to put in an interaction term. You will need to model it in to get the results. Uh, there was another question. Uh, yes. Related is subgroup analysis and post hoc analysis the same thing? Uh, subgroup analysis and the post hoc analysis. Okay. So post hoc analysis has nothing to do with subgroup analysis. Post hoc analysis is uh, analysis which you haven't specified in the protocol before you started doing the analysis. You saw the data and you saw the trend of the data 
and you then decided to test the hypothesis. This is called as a post hoc hypothesis. The problem with this is that this type of analysis are data driven. They are examples of data dredging. They are probably not true effects. These are just simply probably come by chance. Subgroup analysis, as we all know, are predefined subgroups which you as the protocol writer have decided are important for you to see and you have pre-specified them in the protocol and you have analyzed them properly. That is the difference between a properly done subgroup analysis and a post hoc analysis. Uh, there was another question which says that while interpreting forest plot, can you please tell the significance of each notification in the plot? For example, squares of variable size. Okay. Now, squares of variable size are typically seen in meta-analysis. These are not typically seen in randomized control trials. If you are having meta-analysis, the square size basically tells you how strongly the study or how much of an, how should I put it, how much of the effect in that meta-analysis that single study is having. Typically, when you have got a large size box or a large size diamond, that typically means that the study which is putting in that, which is coming in from that, has got a large sample size. Therefore, it is contributing to a greater proportion of the meta-analysis results. The effect size is, of course, where the boundary lies. So this will be, say, for example, the relative risk, hazard ratio, odd ratio, and so on. And you know the tails will be basically the 95% confidence interval. And there was one last question. What is the importance of blinded independent central review in double blinded trials for sensitivity analysis of the investigator assessed primary endpoint? That's an excellent question, uh, Dr. Uh, Kavin. Kavin. Um, Dr. Kavin, yes. Uh, so uh, the importance is this, that when you are evaluating endpoints where the observer bias becomes important, there is a chance that the observer who is not blinded to the treatment results and because we are all humans, we all have our biases, right? We think that IMRT will be superior to 3D CRT because it has got a better dosimetry. And because of that, now suppose you are trying to tell me, okay, go ahead and assess this patient's pain score during <coughs> because of oral mucosis. I know this patient is having IMRT. I know the patient has better dose distribution. So the patient should be having less pain. This is what I imagine. And my outcomes will be biased. If on the other hand, if you have a blinded assessment of the outcome, what you do is that you remove this variable. Now, what is the central review? The central review is done in case of multi-center trials. You can have a situation where you have blinded observers sitting in each of the centers. The problem is that then there is a problem of inter-individual variability in the way the observer assesses the outcome. The central review basically amalgamates all the reviews in a blinded fashion in the central center where the review will be done. And as a result, both the inter-individual variability as well as the uh, variability to do lack of blinding will be eliminated. Now what happens is that when you have got pharma trials, which are basically looking at things like response rate, right? Response rates are typically seen on things like images and they involve what? They involve measurement of size of a tumor, right? Now, if you have ever measured the size of a tumor on a scan, you know the tumor is not a perfect sphere. It is very easy, depending on how you are measuring it, to get it wrong. So that is why you must have a central review. And what the central review tells you is that, okay, investigator has determined that the partial response rate is 20%. But in my central review, the response rate dropped down to 10%. What did it tell? The investigator has significant bias in the direction of response rate. This is where the importance of a blinded, independent, and central review comes in for sensitivity analysis. Well, I don't see any more questions, so and I think we have reached the time. So I thank Dr. Shantam for this excellent talk, uh, covering the uh, giving us an insight into how to read a paper, apply it in clinical practice, as well as going into intricacies of some aspects of that. And uh, I'm sure the viewers must have benefited immensely. 
and it was followed by equally interesting quiz session which everybody enjoyed and uh, i thank the organizers for allowing us to chair this wonderful talk over to dr lata thank you thank you speaker thank you chairperson i think i thought that was a very interesting and interactive session and uh, statistics the only way to learn statistics is by lectures and interactive sessions like this thank you very much i hope the viewers enjoyed it and i welcome all of you back next saturday at about 5 o'clock and we will be continuing uh, with how to write a paper and get it published the speaker will be dr pierce sani who is the edit editor of the national medical journal of india and that will be the concluding lecture for the research methodology series we will be continuing again with the clinical uh, practice sessions and that will go on for another one month so thank you all and have a great evening thank you thank you thank you